the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Well, let me tell you first this evening, dear friends, uh, how noble I think it is of you to be here. I thought a little earlier in the day that we were going to get hit with bad weather for the first time. It's been really remarkable. The bad weather has been all, all around us on Tuesday night. We've never quite had it. I think this is about as bad a night. No, I think there was one night that was worse. But uh, it's very sweet of you to come. We're delighted to have you. Last week, if you will recall, what I tried to do was to summarize our position with regard to Zionism and what Zionism had to say on the subject of Jewish identity in the modern world pivoted around the figure of David Ben-Gurion. Tonight, and for the next two weeks, which is as long as we shall be having this course, I should like to turn my attention to primarily the American scene and the religious answers. Uh, other than Zionism, I do not see any strong, positive way of life which is lived by many Jews, either in America or elsewhere, which can serve as a way of characterizing or as a means of identifying Jews. It's either Zionism or religion as I see it. There have been many efforts made to try to say that a Jew is a Jew by some kind of culture, and some effort made to identify that culture. But as far as I can tell, that culture, at least in the United States, either ends up returning to some kind of religion, or else it ends up turning up to be another kind of American culture, which has certain Jewish roots and antecedents, or is something of a transplant of Polish Jewish culture. At the moment, I don't see Jewish life on a cultural basis being very significant or meaningful in the United States, except in so far as culture is a part of that overall complex of what we understand by what it means to be a Jew in the religious sense of that term. So these next three sessions then are devoted to an analysis of what it means to be a Jew by religion as we understand that term in the United States. And I'm going to spend this evening discussing the orthodox approach next week discussing the conservative approach, and the final week discussing the reformed Jewish approach to this question. Now before I start discussing any one of them, I think it's important to note what a change has taken place in the United States over the last 20 years with regard to this question. Before World War II, it might have been possible with greater strength to argue that a Jew was a Jew in the United States by something other than religion. There was a rather strong and vigorous Yiddishist movement, at least in the major cities, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, Boston. It would have been possible to say that Jews, by virtue of the communities in which they lived, by the kind of associations which they carried on, the stores which they brought into being in their neighborhoods, their Landsmannschaften, or their social groups, the kind of songs they sang, or the foods they ate, these were the things that might have kept them a Jew. And certainly it would have been possible to define Jews as a religious group before World War II, but there were quite a few questions about it. Everybody knew that being a Jew had something to do with being religious. But the attitude toward being religious was a rather ambivalent one. Before World War II, to be religious was something for most Americans, particularly those growing up, those at the uh, university, which was considered rather naive, rather backward, and rather foolish. Uh, it was true that one might have to make a certain bow to the traditional practices so that when your parents wanted you to get married, maybe you did have a rabbi, or if you were growing up, maybe you were bar mitzvah. It didn't really mean anything to you. And the chances were that as soon as you grew up, you would give it up as quickly as you could. It's interesting to see, too, that religion in the minds of many an American in the 30s, many a Jewish American, was still connected with Europe. Judaism was the religion of the immigrant. It was the sign of being a foreigner, a greenhorn. It was connected with uh, the accent 
the inability to speak English properly, the failure to comply to normal American standards. So that it had both psychological and sociological, very real emotional problems connected with it. And mind you, these were the special Jewish problems. These were the special Jewish problems in relation to something that all Americans felt with regard to the intellectual problem of being religious. Um, I don't know how I can remind you best of what the attitude toward the Jewish religion was like in the 30s. Perhaps I can do so by using a favorite example of mine. Um, I think the easiest way to do it is by discussing the role of the mezuzah. Now, if you remember some of the older apartment buildings of the 30s and of the early 40s, you may still live in one, you lucky rent um, <laughs> controlled person, you. There was a very interesting thing used to happen with the mezuzah in those older buildings. The Jews who moved in there were Jews who wanted to observe the Jewish religion, so as a result, they put a mezuzah up on the door. But as years went along and they became more acclimated to the United States, if they remembered to stop and touch it occasionally or give it a kiss as they went in and out, their children who were growing up and going to the university knew that that was a lot of nonsense. You don't put up magical charms on the door to ward off the demons. Anyone who had studied Fraser in the Golden Bough and had taken anthropology knew that this was a lot of nonsense and that when they grew up they were going to run a modern house. And it's interesting to see what happened to those mezuzahs by and large. Because they were on the doorpost, and because in those days the landlords used to paint, you recall the days when the landlords used to paint, I hope, the painter would come along and he would paint the whole door frame, he'd go right over the mezuzah. And this would happen because they used to paint, you know, not only once, they would come back and do it again in the old days. As a result, over a period of time, because while they wanted to have the mezuzah, they didn't really particularly care about it very much more. So as a result, layer after layer of paint would build up until on the doorpost there would be a great big blister in the corner there that no one quite would remember anymore what it was. That was the fate of the mezuzah as the 30s and the early 40s came along. Now it's interesting what has happened today because the transition from before World War II to our own time is so radical with regard to orthodox, conservative, and reform that it must be mentioned. What has happened to the mezuzah? I visit a great many congregations, all kinds of congregations. I assure you, it is not possible to go into a congregation in the United States. I don't care where it is. I have been in Sumter, South Carolina, Toronto, Canada, I have been in Portland, Seattle, Los Angeles, Fort Worth, San Antonio. It's impossible to go into a congregation in the United States and not find there a little shop in which the ladies of the sisterhood send, sell articles. And no matter how reformed that congregation may consider itself, in that little shop, what do you find? You find green mezuzahs and brass mezuzahs and wooden mezuzahs and aluminum mezuzahs and silver mezuzahs and plastic mezuzahs. Now, what are those mezuzahs doing there? It's quite simple. These young people who are, by and large, the people who are alive in these congregations, they want mezuzahs. The same ones who studied Fraser's Golden Bow and who knew all about why they weren't going to be magical are the people who today buy a mezuzah. And many of them even put it up on the door of their house. Now, why do they put it up? Not because they believe in magic, but because they want everybody to know this is a Jewish house. It's not much, and they're not putting up neon signs. They want it to know it's a Jewish house. Now, mind you, if the garbage man, who is probably not a Jew, comes to the door and he sees this thing, it may have Hebrew on the outside, and he will know that there are Jews living in this house the postman, or God forbid, the policeman, or one of the neighbors who was a non-Jew who comes collecting for cerebral something or another. He comes to the door, he sees that mezuzah, he will know that there are Jews, and they don't mind. As a matter of fact, they want him to know. They want the children to know, they want the family to know. Nothing could more quickly typify the changing attitude in religion among our Jews than what has happened to the mezuzah. The very generation that said they wanted no part of this magic and superstition and followed the Raal 
are exactly the people who are today taking something which might have been to their grandfathers magical, but is to them simply a symbol of their Jewishness. They want to be Jewish, and they want to be connected with Jewishness in a religiously identifiable way. Now, this has not come about simply inside the Jewish community itself. I think, first of all, it's necessary to see what's happened to the entire American scene since World War II. It's very instructive if you compare it to what happened after World War I. The effect of World War I was, look, we, we may get killed, uh, you know, we almost got killed, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry, not to mention a few other physical activities which were indulged in, too. But this was the time of no morals and no values, do what you please, you may be dead tomorrow, and we almost were dead, and what kind of a world is it anyway? There's nothing to believe in except getting what you can while you can, so let's get it. And this is the time in which the great books are books of no values, doing what you want to do. This is the Hemingway season par excellence, man asserting himself for what he feels makes him a man. Now you compare that to the results of World War II and the general mood which we have felt in our own time. Another war, a gigantic war, and one which you think would produce exactly the same results as World War I. Namely, people would come back from the war and uh, having almost given up their lives, having almost given up their selves, they would say, I've got a few years to live, I'm gonna enjoy myself, brother, and I don't care what stands in the way. Well, there is partially that. But the great thing which has happened to the United States as a whole, and possibly even to the world, has been a questioning of whether there isn't something important in the world and in the universe. Is there a meaning? Is there a purpose? Are there standards of right and wrong by which we should live? We want to enjoy ourselves, but we'd like to know if that's all there is to the world. Strangely enough, the books which have been written after World War II, which are the, the most influential and the most pervasive, have been books which have dealt with religious questions. Some of them may have said that there is no religious answer. A writer like Camus, who just died, may say there is no religious answer. But his question is a religious question. Is there purpose? Is there meaning in the universe? That's a, that's a religious yearning. And writers like Graham Greene uh, in England have dealt primarily with religious themes. There has been, I think, since World War II, particularly as contrasted with World War I, a different attitude toward the world and man's place in it. Part of it comes from a failure of science to keep us from going to war, and from the contrary, inventing better and better ways of our killing ourselves. Part of it comes from the failure of liberal politics to save the world for peace, brotherhood, and justice, but to only make things in their own ways as problematic and as difficult as they were even before the Democrats got into office with a new deal. Uh, the Eisenhower crusade, a religious term you will note, has not produced any measurably greater results in helping the world become better. And all these things that people may have looked for, for truth, have played out. We are searching, I think. We wish we could find a religious answer. For some people, I think, religion is a result of this new mood. But for the Jew, it has done something rather special. For the Jew, it has made it possible for him to be religious in a way he couldn't be before. In the 30s, in the early 40s, the Jew was just dying to be an American. He'd do anything to be an American. He was, as usual, going to be more American than the Americans. And therefore, if the highest standards of American culture as reflected by the Columbia and New York University campuses and by the writers uh, and thinkers of Greenwich Village, who in a way almost set the tone for America, if these were the people who are going to be sophisticated and atheist, then he was certainly going to be sophisticated and atheist. For them, it was an intellectual freedom, a freedom from being a, uh, perhaps a straight-laced Protestant. But for the Jew, atheism was an escape from everything foreign and backward and ghetto-like, everything that separated him from his fellow man. But now what happened? 
all of a sudden it's become the thing to be religious. Everybody ought to be a little religious. He ought to have a certain kind of religious point of view. If you're going to be a good American, you ought to have something to do with the religious movement. Therefore, the Jew who wants to be an American suddenly discovers that if he's going to be an American, he has to somehow be connected with a religious group. And by George, his religious group, small as it is, only five million, is somehow considered right up there with the groups with their 70 millions and 50 millions, and their three partners. Protestant, Catholic, Jew. How the Jew managed to gain a third partnership in this, with this numerical uh, difficulty is a little hard to understand, although it's quite clear that the Jews have always wielded an influence much greater than their uh, small numbers would indicate, perhaps because they are settled in the large cities, and particularly because of their influence in New York uh, City with its uh, tremendous impact upon all of the United States. So the, the Jew suddenly found himself in a quite natural position, everybody else is being religious, well maybe he should be religious. And after all, being a Jew was to be one of the great partnership, Protestant, Catholic, Jew. Therefore, it was a very easy niche for the Jew to find himself. So if you want to be an American, and you're a Jew, and you're not running away anymore, because somehow it's suddenly become a decent thing to be a Jew now, America accepts you. And America accepts you on a religious basis. It's really rather remarkable, I think, that while the swastikas were going on a few weeks ago, there was a momentary shudder, I think, ran through the American Jewish community. But after the momentary shudder passed by, nobody got terribly excited. A few people got terribly excited. But I mean, by and large, the American Jewish community was convinced, I think, that it had a place here in the United States and that the swastikas were the result of uh, hoodlums and a certain kind of hooliganism. And that by and large, with the officials taking the attitude they did, nothing terrible was going to happen, and it didn't. The American knew he had a place in the United States, and that his place was there not escaping from his Judaism, but as a Jew. It was in being a Jew and allowing himself to be identified as such that he could feel relatively at home here. The truth of the matter is that now that the generations have passed a little bit, and those of us who were in school in the 30s have grown up a little bit, we've discovered that to be an American doesn't mean to run away from being a Jew, but that to the contrary. The more we are Jews, the somehow easier and the more simple it is to fit into the American pattern. We have become acclimated. To be a Jew is no longer to be a foreigner. To be a Jew is no longer to be a Pole or a Russian. To be a Jew doesn't mean you have to speak with an accent and have a crooked nose, wear a beard, and have uh, unkempt hair. No. To be a Jew is to be an American today. If you happen to have an accent or if you happen to have a peculiar nose, uh, it's all right. It's your privilege. People can have what they want to. Things are getting rather mature in this democracy, and while there's a, a lot that we don't like, the Jew has that. And then one other factor emerged, which has changed the entire Jewish attitude toward religion. And that's the breakup of the old neighborhoods. In the old neighborhoods, it wasn't necessary to worry about this problem. It wasn't necessary to worry because in so many neighborhoods in the large cities, everybody was a Jew. Well, not everybody was a Jew. The overwhelming majority of people were Jews. You didn't have to pay any attention to the non-Jews. They certainly didn't impinge themselves on your life. Because there were so many Jews around that you knew you were a Jew by associating with these other Jews. Now, I happen to be a Midwesterner by upbringing, and as a result, the sight of a gigantic apartment building still fills me with, with a certain amount of awe. And mentally, I play a little game, which uh, I'm not sure native-born New Yorkers or people who are accustomed to it can do. Have you ever taken one of these apartment buildings apart? apartment by apartment, floor by floor, and taken one big building and set all the apartments out on about a fourth or a fifth or a sixth of an acre of ground. Just take the apartment building apart as if it were all little single houses put together. One of those apartment buildings has as many Jews as many a city in the entire United States. Many a small town of 25,000 people or 50,000 people has only as many Jews as in one apartment building in the Bronx or in the Queens or Brooklyn, and you can have row after row of those apartment buildings. 
So the, many people grew up in neighborhoods where Yiddish was a common language. We all know the famous Italian or Chinese cops who had to speak Yiddish because they were assigned to a Jewish neighborhood and they spoke Yiddish. There wasn't any question about it. And the stores handled so-called Jewish food. The newsstands had Yiddish newspapers. The, the conversations involved Jewish things. It had nothing to do with religion whatsoever. But those neighborhoods have by and large given up the ghost. Name almost any city in the United States. The larger the city, the more radical the shift. One doesn't have to describe it very much. It is the famous move to suburbia, partially due to the rising economic status of almost everybody in the United States, the consequent desire to have better living conditions, the place available for them not being in the center of the city, particularly if you're young and with children, and therefore the consequent move out but when you move out, what you want is not what you had, generally. Even the apartment buildings can't be quite as close together. It's still possible in the New York City area and some of the suburbs to find Jews packed more densely than anywhere else in the world, probably including Tel Aviv, because the apartment buildings don't go quite as high there. But that's something of an exaggeration. On the other hand, as Jews have moved out of the old neighborhoods, and moved into the newer neighborhoods, new problems have arisen. And the problems are particularly acute in areas where Jews are scattered among other people. Because if you move into a new housing development, almost anywhere, it will probably turn out after a while that the density of Jews there is higher than in any other city in the United States, to be sure. But you can't tell whether the neighbor in the house next to yours is a Jew or a non-Jew. You can't tell anyone. He doesn't speak Yiddish and you don't speak Yiddish. He doesn't get a Yiddish newspaper delivered or a Hebrew newspaper, and he's certainly not to be seen reading a Hebrew book. The chances are he doesn't observe any particular Jewish customs. And therefore, even if you're willing to pry on Friday night to see if they're lighting candles, the chances are you can't tell. He speaks English. He's probably had as much education as you have, may have served in the Army, Navy, or Air Force wherever you or your spouse did, sends his children to the same kind of school or the rest. Now, how do you know whether he's a Jew or not? But why should it be important? Why should you care? Because you are a Jew. And you know that being a Jew somehow means being involved with other Jews. And that if your Jewishness is to mean anything, if your identity is to make any sense, you have to have some relationship with other Jews. What's going to make you be a Jew? And probably more important, what's going to make your child a Jew? You might be for yourself willing to, you know, do one thing or another. But when everything else goes among Jews, the desire to perpetuate Jewishness still remains. It is interesting that this is such a cardinal principle of Judaism that the next generation has to be Jewish. Ultimately, it comes back to something in the Jewish religion. It wouldn't be there otherwise and we should get around to it in the next couple of weeks. But the children have to grow up being Jewish. Therefore, the whole need to do something for the children's sake, and in an unconscious way, generally, for the adult's sake. The adult, too, wants to know, well, if he is going to be a Jew, what does it mean? And if it is such a good thing, and if it's such an important thing, and if everybody else is being religious, maybe I should find out, too. And thus, there is a new mood there's an entirely different mood and attitude toward the Jewish religion today than there once was. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying, and I don't want you to understand me as saying, that I think Jews are religious today. And I use the word religious, as you will come to discover very quickly, I think, not as to whether or not they observe Shabbos or keep kashras. But I mean it in every dimension, both of observance as well as of inner personal feeling, of some feeling of a personal relationship with God, the ability to pray, the willingness to study the Jewish tradition, as well as kashras and Shabbos and all the rest. I don't think Jews are particularly religious today, but I think we would be untrue to ourselves if we didn't recognize that for the first time, the American Jewish community, by and large, not every individual, has begun to ask religious questions. 
There is an interest in religion today that didn't used to be there. There is a status to religion today that didn't used to be there. It's almost possible to say that you're religious without being ashamed of it. You know, you're still a little bit on the defensive when somebody finds out you're going to the synagogue regularly. God forbid what happened to you, and such a nice, intelligent person, all of a sudden you're going to shul. You know, you're still on the defensive a little bit. But it happens. It happens now that people do go to the synagogue, and they like it, and they say they like it. And they look at the other fellows that he's crazy a little bit. Now that's a new mood. And for a change, the religious institutions are there working with it. The Orthodox group is ready, the conservative group is ready, the reform group is ready. And for a change now, people coming into synagogues are there to be worked with. There is a younger generation, there are young people, there are children. An opportunity has been given to the American Jewish community to do something that it couldn't do 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the American Jewish religious community worried about survival. Are we going to survive? Today, we know we're going to survive in this generation. The question is, can we survive in a significant way? Will there be anything worthwhile about Jewishness? How positive will it be? How intensive will it be? We're not so much worried about the whole thing going down in our day. Take a generation or two, at least. That's not our problem. Our problem is quality, character. So that at the moment we stand in an unusual position. May I, if I am not, uh, if I am not too religious for you at this moment, point out to you how odd it is of God to have done this thing to us. What did he do? He took the Jews out of the ghetto in the 19th century, at the beginning of the 19th century, and gave them a chance to get adjusted to freedom and equality in various countries. And most of the experiments went under. It didn't work out. The liberalization of Jewry in Germany didn't ever really take root there. The Haskalah movement died out. Various other offshoots of one kind or another didn't amount to anything. Zionism simply took the Jews up and put them in another country elsewhere. And then what happened? Then the ghettos of Russia and Poland and Bulgaria and Romania were emptied once again because the Jews who came from those countries were in the ghetto. And they came to this country between 1880 and 1925 largely. And therefore, what we are doing is reliving what happened at the beginning of the 19th century. We are getting a second crack at the question, what does it mean to be a Jew in a modern world? Only we have the benefit of a hundred years of experience behind us, more than that. We, the Jewish community of the United States, has the benefit of a hundred, 125 years of Jewish experimenting in various communities with us. And at this moment, Precisely at the time after six million Jews were destroyed, the American Jewish community has become conscious of its real problem. Not only do we have the chance to meet the problem, not only do we have the benefit of what happened before, but there is a consciousness that either this generation and the next generation will meet the problem of how to live in the United States, or else sooner or later the thing will go under. We know our problem. We are consciously working forward to meeting it. And that's why I addressed myself to this question at the very beginning of our sessions, because this is the root question in the American Jewish community today. What does it mean to be a Jew? Because we want to be, we would like to be Jews. If only there were some way of being a Jew which was both Jewish and modern at the same time. We are those Jews who have come out of the ghetto, maybe a generation or two back, emerging into the modern society. And we now see for the second time that this is really the basic and unsolved problem of our day. Now this change in the attitude toward religion and this change in the whole attitude towards Jewishness this peculiar and unique historical moment of promise in which we stand, even though it may turn out to be another failure. 
this peculiar moment in which we stand, which offers at least some sense of hope, is nowhere better to be seen, I think, than in Orthodox Judaism. If I said to you that the Reformed Jews were meeting and going forward to be modern people and were making some kind of a reasonable synthesis, you might doubt that the Reformed Jews were Jews, but if they're not making a synthesis, then what are they doing? That's their whole purpose in being, is to somehow be modern. If I said to you the conservative Jews were doing it, then that's interesting at least. Because after all, a conservative Jew is somehow more of a Jew than a reformed Jew, and he's certainly more modern than an orthodox Jew, so you're still not surprised. Therefore, I think it important to begin with orthodoxy. The mood is seen, I think, most clearly in the kind of orthodox Judaism which is emerging in the United States. This new, hopeful, progressive, forward, Adaptation and effort to meet the problem is, I think, seen better there than any place else. Now, why do I say that? I say that because 20 years ago, I think we all would have believed that orthodoxy was just about dead. So, another generation or two, all right, the old men in the shul with their snuff boxes and the beards and the, the spittoons on the floor, all right, so let them have it for a while, it will soon be gone. But that's not what you see. It's not what you see as you travel around the country. Today. What do you see? You see ranch-style Orthodox synagogues and split-level Orthodox synagogues. And uh, on Fifth Avenue, a, a typical uh, Jewish approach, if I may say so, a Fifth Avenue synagogue, which is on a side street, uh, in which an elevator runs all the time, up and down, designed by a modern architect with beautiful stonework in the front. All over the country, that's what you see. Spittoons? No spittoons in sight. Old dirty men with beards? Nowhere. The characters of uh, Chayefsky's The Tenth Man couldn't even get into a contemporary Orthodox synagogue which called itself respectable. I was riding with a taxi cab driver the other night, and he noticed that uh, I had come out of a, of a Jewish institution, and uh, so immediately he proceeded to tell me his tale of woe. Uh, I had come out of Temple Emmanuel after going to services on Friday evening, the early service at Temple Emmanuel, and he said to me, what do you think? I, I just went to a synagogue. I stopped at a certain synagogue. He mentioned the street. I quickly checked off the fact that it was neither reform nor conservative as far as I knew. And he said he went in. His mother had just died. He had finished sitting Shiva, and he went in to say Kaddish in the evening. And he said he went to the door and they wouldn't let him in. He wasn't dressed properly. <laughs> he had a little gabardine zipper jacket on, but they wouldn't let him in. As a matter of fact, they didn't want to let him stay there. But he, being a Jew, thank God, Jews can be stubborn sometimes in the most marvelous way. I mean, if you need nine men to say Kaddish with, so he wasn't in the same room with them, but there were nine men in the other room at least, so he stood in the foyer and said his Kaddish. Maybe Chayefsky can make a play out of that, I don't know. But that's the kind of orthodoxy we have today. You have new synagogues. And uh, as one travels around, very Balabatisha people belong to them. One doesn't have the feeling now that one is dealing with poverty or immigrants or the like. One is dealing with uh, an entirely new element that's orthodox. And one looks at the leadership, and the leadership are not old fogies. They are young people, modern people, professional people with college degrees, all kinds of college degrees. Perhaps nowhere is the, is the vitality and the virility of contemporary Orthodox Judaism seen more strongly than in the day school. Now, I don't want to go into the reasons as to why the day school has grown so quickly, but it, nonetheless the fact remains that the Orthodox movement in the United States has developed a series of all-day schools, private schools, not allowed to be called parochial schools because they're not parish schools, you see. So they're all day schools. But I have to make clear that you understand what I'm talking about. This is a parochial school, which is otherwise known as an all day school. These Jewish schools have, up until a year ago, been the fastest growing element in the field of Jewish education. So that today, about 10% of all Jewish children engaged in going to Jewish schools are going to, almost said it, are going to Jewish all-day schools. There's a tremendous number, and the all-day schools are growing 
uh, very rapidly, and there is great hope among the Orthodox that uh, these will be the basis of the educated laity which they feel are required for Orthodox Judaism. What has happened to Orthodoxy in the United States that is so different from what Orthodoxy was 20 years ago? I think the answer is quite simple. To be Orthodox has become respectable. Today a person can easily be an Orthodox Jew without any question or conflict in his mind about being an American. Now I understand that logically speaking that was also true in the 30s. But as a matter of emotional fact, it was not true. As a matter of emotional reality to be Orthodox was somehow to be foreign. But not today. Today to be Orthodox is somehow to be uh, an American of a certain religious point of view, which is quite well accepted. It brands you as neither inferior socially, neither inferior economically, and neither inferior intellectually. To be an Orthodox Jew today is to be as acceptable a kind of Jew as anything else. It has for the first time become possible really to have an American Jewish Orthodoxy. Now I think the symbol of what has happened to Orthodox Judaism in the United States is to be found nowhere better than in Yeshiva University. In the first place, take that magnificent name, Yeshiva University. The university was originally a Christian institution in which Christian scholars, primarily interested in theology, gathered to found a faculty which had a single point of view, that is to say, which was looking for a, a, a universal kind of knowledge in which they could all participate in their specialties. Today, the university now is a yeshiva university. Now, what was a yeshiva? A yeshiva was a Jewish type university, so to speak. But it was a place where people of more than usual Jewish knowledge went and studied and studied and studied and studied. One could spend his whole life there. One could go for a degree uh, under certain circumstances, particularly in Eastern and Central Europe. A whole life should be spent as part of a yeshiva. Now, what has happened to the old yeshiva? To have a yeshiva in the United States is either to have a primary school for children we want to have the word yeshiva connected with the education of our children. Therefore, if we have an all-day school, we like to call it a yeshiva on the grounds that somehow our children are getting what our grandfathers got in Poland or Russia. Or else it becomes a university. Yeshiva now becomes a university. The higher knowledge is not just Jewish knowledge now. It is general knowledge. Now, of course, there's a Jewish faculty and there's a rabbinical school connected with it. But yeshiva is not just the name of the rabbinical school. The rabbinical school is the Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary. It's one college of the university. The whole university is called the yeshiva. What could be more typical of the way in which orthodoxy has become respectable in the United States? And there is probably no more single significant institution in the United States than the orthodox institution than Yeshiva University. And the fact that it has a medical school, the fact that it has a, a school of, uh, of education, fills the orthodox Jew with pride. It is his pride that this great Jewish school of higher learning is there. There's also a rabbinical school, and occasionally people pay attention to that too, but the Albert Einstein Medical College, the pride and joy, the dignity of the entire thing. Now, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say very simply, if you analyze the feelings of the American Jew with regard to, the, to Yeshiva University, you see how a, how a combination has been worked out between what is traditional and what is modern that is meaningful and significant and gives people a great deal of pride and satisfaction. I wish it were possible for me uh, to speak of Samuel Belkin, whose name I have uh, connected with the lecture for this evening in terms of an ideologue of a philosopher of Orthodox Judaism and the role of Orthodox Judaism in our time. But if you will forgive me after reading his recent book of speeches and essays on traditional Judaism and its role in the United States as president of this great university, all I can say to you is that in my opinion, 
I urge you to read it for yourself, a little book published by Philosophical Library, whose name I've forgotten, Essays in Traditional Jewish Thought, I think it was called. Well, in my opinion, the book is exactly what the university is. It's Jewish enough to be Jewish, and it's modern enough to be modern, but exactly how the combination is made is not quite clear, except that you can feel proud about it. The English is beautiful. The style is wonderful. The Jewishness is unimpeachable. And one can feel a great sense of warmth and regard and pleasure in dealing with it. But what is the problem? The problem of contemporary orthodoxy is a very simple one, namely that Jewish orthodoxy cannot survive simply by being respectable. Sooner or later to be orthodox means to come to terms if, with the intellectual and the legal aspects of being a Jew. Can one accept the orthodox tradition in terms of what it has to say, namely, that the Torah is given to us by God and is therefore superior to any kind of knowledge that man may have, although man may use his knowledge to interpret the Torah. It is the Torah first and all the rest of knowledge second. It is the problem of Genesis 1. How do you deal with the creation story when it says quite specifically that the world was created in six days and on the seventh day God himself rested? And it is the problem of observance Maybe not the question of whether or not your job permits you to take off on Shabbos, but if you do have the day off on Shabbos, are you allowed to turn on the television set in the afternoon in case Bernstein should be giving a concert for the children and you think it would be helpful for your children after coming home from services to see this wonderful concert? Are you allowed to turn on that television set? Now these, I think, are the real problems which affect orthodoxy, and I wish I could say to you that one had a great deal of, of uh, intellectual ferment and thinking going on which has tried to resolve these problems. I don't think that's true. Modern orthodoxy has been without a philosopher. The closest thing one comes to a philosopher of modern orthodoxy, believe it or not, is Herman Woke. And I think he needs to be considered in all seriousness as an exponent of a certain kind of attitude toward orthodoxy which is convincing to many people. Let me, as best I can, therefore, and rather rapidly, trace through some of the various strands in contemporary orthodoxy which are seeking to solve the problem of what it means to be an orthodox Jew. One of them is doing so from a negative point of view. It's sometimes easier to sell what you want to sell by tearing down the other person's product. So that we have one or two orthodox leaders whose main interest today is pointing out that the Reformed Jews are obviously Christian. They're certainly not Jews in any sensible term, but at even greater danger are the conservative Jews. Because you think when you're dealing with a conservative Jew that you are dealing with Jewish law, but you're not. They tamper with Jewish law and they fiddle with Jewish law, and it's not really Jewish, it's strafe. And because you might be confused by the conservative Jews, the conservative Jews are the worst enemies of orthodoxy. And this point of view says, we should not cooperate with them. We should pull out of all organizations where there is an effort made to have, not Catholic, Protestant, Jew, but Orthodox conservative reform. Because there's only one Torah, and there's only one real Judaism, and that's the Judaism of Orthodoxy. Now this movement, which uh, boils up from time to time, in this point of view, may be traced back to our dear friend Samson Raphael Hirsch. You recall that Samson Ratio Hirsch, the founder of modern orthodoxy, who probably would have been very delighted with the way in which American Jews have put together Torah in Derech Eretz, Torah with a proper way of, of living in our society. It was his point of view that the traditional Jew should pull out of the community, the uniform community of Europe, and not take part in it, because by doing so he seemed to indicate that he really did consider the liberal Jew to be somehow authentically a Jew. Well, say these American leaders, agreeing with Samson Rakehor, they're not really Jews. To be a Jew means to be a Jew by religion. To be a Jew by religion means to observe the Torah. If they don't observe the Torah and they won't abide by the Torah, then they might just as well not be Jews, and let's not have anything to do with it. Let's certainly not encourage them. 
If Jews in the United States are ever going to amount to anything, they better get around to recognizing the role of Torah in Jewish life. And there's only one way to do it. Let's make the issue hard and fast. And I think this is the most negative point of view heard in contemporary orthodoxy. From my point of view, Herman Woke's position is also essentially negative. It's not so obviously negative. It is, I think, more unconsciously negative. And I think if one analyzes without too much care, the structure both of the Cain mutiny and of Marjorie Morningstar, it's quite clear what Woke's essential spiritual position is. This Is My God is, I think, a lot less helpful than those two books. The reason why is precisely the problem that we have with Belkin. As soon as you come to a critical problem, Woke leaves you and runs away. When you want to deal with either Genesis 1 or Kashrus, he has a little statement about discipline or about accepting certain things, and every religion has them in the life, and then you're off. But why? Why doesn't he want to face those problems head on? I mean, Maimonides did in his time, and other traditional Jews have not hesitated to try to meet these problems. Why doesn't he? I think the answer is given by the novels. Now, I, I, I think you have to start with the Cain mutiny. The hero of the Cain mutiny, you will recall, I hope, is not the man who leads the mutiny, nor is it the Jewish lawyer who saves him. The hero of the Cain mutiny is Captain Quig the man who was betrayed, the man who was mutinied against, if there is such an expression in the Hanglish language. It is Quig who is the hero. Why do I say that? You will recall at the party at the end of the book where the Jewish lawyer is getting drunker and drunker, and he is congratulated both by the young uh, Italian, I believe, whom he has saved, and the snippy intellectual who started the whole thing off but kept his hands clean, Lieutenant Kiefer, the real villain of the book. You will recall what Greenfield says. He says he didn't want to do this to Queek. Why? Because he had a grandmother, and his grandmother was in Poland, and the Nazis came and took his grandmother and burned her and turned her fat into a bar of soap. And the only thing standing in the way of Hitler's turning all America, and particularly American Jews, into bars of soap were men like Queen, who for all their neurotic mishigas, were there in the Navy, standing guard, ready to protect us. Whereas all the liberals and all the do-gooders were the fellows who weren't trained and who weren't ready and who would have vacillated a hundred different ways. A real protection came from these men who had given their lives to protect us. And even if they were neurotic, we should rather be thankful to them what they had done for us. Now that's a powerful argument. It's a complete reversal of everything which you're bright young intellectual of the 30s believed, which is exactly why the villain of the book is Lieutenant Kiefer, the guy who writes the novel of the old side, the, the, the fellow with the psychoanalytic point of view, the bright young intellectual. Now, what does that say? It says that in order to keep from the danger of anarchy, it is necessary for us to have a certain defense. The danger of anarchy and of the nihilistic forces, the negative, the destroying forces in the universe is so great that no matter if you have to pay a price, it's important to be able to be on the defense against them. That defense against what's negative is worth a price you may have to pay for it because you can't stand the threat of these forces pressing in on you. And you will recall that in large part, this was the problem with Marjorie Morningstar. Marjorie Morningstar, this terribly long book, how anyone could wait so long to seduce a female, whether it was moral or not, I mean, by the time one finally got to the seduction, it hardly seemed worth it. <laughs> 
But and I understand the editors cut the book down to 600 pages from 1,300 pages. My God, that would have been a chase otherwise. In any case, it's significant what takes place when the final seduction takes place. In the first place, you will recall that it is not Noel Ehrman, our, again, bright, young, twisted, even to the arm, Jewish, although running away from his Judaism, uh, song and dance man, the clever, creative type. He doesn't see Deuce Marjorie. He probably gets bored after a while and gives up trying. Maybe he read the book. <laughs> but what he does do, one night she finally announces her availability. Now what is it that makes it finally possible for Marjorie to announce her availability to our friend Noel? It's very simple. It is part of a general process of degradation which goes on, which is climaxed by the other thing she does that evening. Now, you may not remember what she did that evening, but that was the night that they decided that they were going to have dinner in. And when they had dinner in, they ordered, I don't know what you had for supper tonight, they ordered pork chow mein. Now, she had been willing to break the rules with regard to swarming things. She had already eaten shrimp previously, but she had never eaten chazer. And this was the first time that she finally ate chazer. And as that standard went, so too... What are you laughing at? I'm really not trying to be funny at all. Believe me, I'm trying to be as serious as I can because this is... This is exactly his point. You can't hope to break down standards in one part without breaking down standards in another part. You can't say, I'm going to give up a little bit here, but all the rest I'm going to keep. Oh, no. This is queen. If you're going to keep away from the negative, immoral, destructive forces of the universe, you need some framework, some rigid defense to keep you out, and that's orthodoxy. It's the traditional pattern of the Orthodox Jewish life which tells you what to do and what not to do. Tells you where you stand and where you mustn't stand. And therefore, the way that you depart from sinfulness is to follow the law and to follow it thoroughly all the way. Now, from my point of view, this is a negative defense of the tradition because it is, I think it has to be termed, a neurotic defense of the tradition. A person has to be so insecure, at least from my liberal point of view, with regard to the universe, that he is afraid if he gives up one thing, he gives up everything. Whether it is possible to eat treif and not get involved in sexual immorality, I guess we will have to leave to some future Jewish type Dr. Kinsey. <laughs> On the other hand, from Woke's point of view, his attitude toward religion is that it's all or nothing. And the danger of nothing is so great to him that he says, let's have it all. Because if we don't have it all, we may get involved in nothingness. Now, that's exactly the kind of religion that Freud describes in his understanding of what religion is. Religion which is essentially compulsive, religion which is essentially rigid and strict and formal, which if part of it breaks down, the whole universe tends to crumble. Now, Woke is modern about it, and he's certainly sophisticated about it, and he's charming about it, and he's delightful about it. But I think you understand his Judaism better from the novels than from This Is My God. In This Is My God, he does all the standard things that I think can be done about the beauty of living as a Jew. Now, the more positive approaches to traditional Judaism are, I think, to be found in the newly emerging work of the American trained Orthodox rabbinate. It's pretty much the kind of positive thing that Woke does. I guess Emmanuel Rackman has to be listed as the, the leader, the most literate, or at least the most available of all the Orthodox rabbis who are writing in this way. And what they are writing and trying to say is look at the beauty of the tradition. Supposing you really lived as a traditional Jew, look what it would do to your life. 
And what they do is they try to show how by following the Jewish traditional law, so many of the problems that Americans have would be solved. Supposing you really observe the Shabbos, really observe the Shabbos. Yes, we know it causes certain inconveniences and difficulties economically. But look at the difficulties that you get into this way because you don't observe Shabbos, because you don't take a day of rest, and because the day of rest turns out to be another day of work, because you don't pray, because you don't study, because you don't really have a Shabbosic day in your week. And there is a second theme to what they are writing. It is a kind of a hope for what orthodoxy may be, might be able yet to do about your turning the television set on on Shabbos afternoon. They don't say that the law can change because they know it can't change. But there is a hope that the problem of the television set on Shabbos afternoon, the question of the interpretation of Genesis 1, will yet be solved. Rackman keeps talking about Soloveitchik and the work that Soloveitchik has done in the United States in terms of rethinking Jewish law. The only trouble is Soloveitchik won't publish anything, and therefore it's a little difficult to say whether or not Soloveitchik is doing anything that's of any help to the traditional Jew. Or there is always the hope that a Sanhedrin may be set up in the state of Israel, and the Sanhedrin will then continue to help develop Jewish law. Or there is always the faith that Judaism has managed a way to move forward, find a way to move forward into the future, and it will find a way to do so here in the United States. There is not only the notion of look at the beauty of the tradition, but there is also the hope that the tradition too will find ways to grow and adapt itself. If there is, however, any group which is, I think, at least as far as I can tell, the one which is at least the most, the most intellectually aggressive, small, but intellectually aggressive, willing to meet the problems head on, it is some of the smaller of the Hasidic groups, particularly the Lubavitcher Hasidim, begin to publish little things now in English, begin to send out people to talk to Jews about the meaning of what it is to be a traditional Jew, and they shirk no problems. Genesis 1? They'll talk about Genesis 1 to you. Shabbos? They'll talk about Shabbos. And for a change, they're willing to take their stand on the eternity of the Torah. But God gave the Torah. And they're willing to come to an understanding of what it means to say God gave the Torah that may not be convincing to an avowed liberal, but at least is an honest statement of what a modern man who knows what it means to be educated thinks when he says God gave the Torah with a passion and with a fervor and with a devotion and with a life lived by it, without any of the interesting little compromises. Americans don't go around with beards, therefore Orthodox Jews no longer wear beards, except the Hasidim. The American Orthodox Jew doesn't wear a beard because it says no razor shall touch your skin. So if you can find a way of getting the beard off without the razor touching your skin, that's kosher. And you can, either by using a depilatory or by using certain kinds of electric razors which are shielded so that the razor never touches the skin or only touches the hair. <laughs> now this is the kind of compromise the Hasidim refused to make. They say, come on, let's, let's, we know what we're talking about. A Jew should have a beard. Jews have had beards. Jews have beards. And Jews ought to have beards. But is that really important? Really, if God wanted you to have a beard, you'd have a beard, wouldn't you? The real problem is, what's your relationship to God? What, 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 about the, what are you going to do about the fact that the Jewish tradition has said that there is a Torah? The Jews who have lived by this Torah have been made holy people. All right, so you're not in the mood to be a saint at the moment. But what are you going to do about this fact? That this is what it was always meant to be a Jew. And more than that, they preach with their lives. They preach with the way bright, young, intelligent men and women live Jewishly recognizable lives that are quite significant. And some of the writings, I think, will, over a period of time, have a rather more of an influence. I'm sorry that this has to be so chaotic in my presentation to you, but it's hard to find contemporary spokesmen from orthodoxy who will sit down and state their intellectual point of view. And this is the real problem with contemporary orthodoxy. That it's not only disorganized intellectually, it's disorganized even institutionally. 
There are probably more Orthodox synagogues in the United States than any other kind of synagogue, but some of them are only storefronts. At least the conservative and the reform Jews are organized into national associations. The Orthodox movement is split into all kinds of splinters. Yeshiva University is, for a university, doing rather peculiar things. It begins to organize congregations and serve congregations with uh, youth group programs and adult education programs. And on the other hand, the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations is trying to organize Orthodox congregations into a single group. But there's no leadership there. There's no real dominant movement, either intellectual or otherwise. And if there is one large American-trained Orthodox rabbis group, the Rabbinical Council of America, there are a couple of others, which are somewhat smaller. And of the European-trained rabbis, there are several others. No, no single voice to speak with unity and uniformity. I think the picture for orthodoxy in our time is very hopeful. I think orthodoxy, in general, has gotten a new and respectable place in the United States. I think our country now knows that it's possible to be orthodox and to be a very valuable and significant citizen. I think that's true among Jews, too. The problem with orthodoxy is that this is only an opportunity. The orthodox Jew has yet got come to terms with his basic problems. The problems of the intellectual ability to accept the Torah as the word of God, and therefore the ability to live a way of life which really marks one off as different from most Americans. But I don't think we can say what we said 20 years ago. I don't think we can say that orthodoxy is going to disappear. To the contrary, I think orthodoxy is going to grow and become more vigorous and have a great deal to say about what it means to be a Jew in the United States. Because the Orthodox Jew has one thing that no other Jew has. He knows that he is genuine. He has the feeling that he has not betrayed his great-grandfather. If his great-grandfather came back to this country with a few changes in the way he lived, he would nonetheless recognize him as a Jew. Most other Jews cannot make that statement. But the problem is, from their point of view, can they be true to great-grandfather and be true to themselves at the same time? While I think orthodoxy has a great deal to say, and while I think it has a great future in the United States, I don't think that orthodoxy is going to be the answer for most American Jews. Because most American Jews want to be true to great-grandfather, but first they want to be true to themselves, to their knowledge, to their education, and to their way of life. And therefore, for most American Jews, the answer is going to lie, probably, somewhere with either conservative or reform Judaism, and we shall turn to them next week and the week after. And now we have a little time left over for questions. Yes, please. You said that the typical of American Jewry to begin with were people who were not Orthodox. And yet, of course, the, uh, those from Europe came from Orthodox backgrounds. Did they change on the way of Rome? Well, you know, I have been jumping uh, continents and centuries here so quickly that um, I've given you a misconception there. I sometimes wonder whether I've given you more misconceptions than uh, ideas here. No, uh, um, what you understood me to have said, I may have said, but if I did, I didn't mean, and I hereby withdraw, all right? The first Jews who came to this country were traditional, that is to say, Orthodox Jews. But when, the, when America began to have large-scale Jewish communities in the middle of the 19th century, the dominant mood of those American Jewish communities became reform. They were, by and large, mostly traditional to begin with. But under the impact of the American environment, plus the knowledge that they had had of liberalism in Germany, they tended to become liberal in the United States under the circumstances here uh, very quickly. So that as a result, up until the time of World War I, the Reform Jews were dominant almost everywhere in the American Jewish community, even though by that time, 1914, they were numerically a very tiny portion or, uh, of the uh, American Jewish uh, community. When the immigration had started in large numbers in the late 1870s, of Eastern and Central European Jews, they were all either traditional or secular Jews. If they were Jewishly observant, however, they were traditionally observant. 
And these were the people who have made up the base both of conservative and of orthodox Judaism in the United States. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, is there a trend, a noticeable trend now back toward the uh, uh, orthodox Jews from the uh, reform? No, there's not a noticeable trend back toward orthodoxy from reform, but one finds certain other indications. The overwhelming majority of American Jews uh, are not affiliated with any religious movement. That is to say, they are not part of any normal synagogue. Now, if you ask these people what they are, a great number, at least up until recent times, would always say, oh, I'm Orthodox. But they were never part of an Orthodox synagogue. Now, for years, this large reservoir has been feeding conservative, and to some lesser extent, but uh, to a considerable extent, reform synagogues for the last 10 or 12 years. What's happened is that it's now begun to feed orthodox congregations as well. And with the increasing affiliation of large numbers of Jews, orthodox affiliation is rising as almost as quickly, not quite as quickly, well, I shouldn't even put it that way. Orthodox affiliation is rising rather rapidly, perhaps not as rapidly as conservative or reform, because in the suburbs, one organizes either a reform or a conservative congregation first, and only after a very long period of time, an orthodox congregation. But orthodox affiliation is rising, and the orthodox congregations which are in existence in many places are showing new signs of vitality. Uh, I, still, I don't think orthodoxy is on its way toward becoming dominant or toward winning the majority of people. Yeah, but it shows a kind of vitality we hadn't expected. That's all I think can be said. Well, what is the problem of the first chapter of Genesis? The problem of the first chapter of Genesis is that it says the world was created in six days. And the problem is that if you go to the university, they'll tell you that it was millions and billions of years and if you study geology, they tell you that the Placistocene and the Miocene and the Paleolithic are hundreds of thousands of years. Now you have a problem. Well, the other churches all settled this very badly. Yeah, well, more or less. <laughs> it involves you sooner or later either in interpreting away what is meant by the words day. You know, is it 100,000 years, 100 million years? A day in thy sight, or about 1,000 years is when it passed. There's only one problem with that. The chapter says that on the seventh day, he rested, and that's the Sabbath. Therefore, if one of those days is 100 million years, you don't observe the Sabbath until, you know, 600 million years have gone by. And that's not Jewish. <laughs> to a Jew, it's a week. Now, if you want to get around that, I guess you can get around that. You know, yes, of course, it, it's both, and it's one and another, and we interpret it as a week, but it really might have been a longer period of time. And if you're traditional, you have no difficulty with it. The only trouble is that that requires you to do something with that chapter, which you don't do with other things when you read them. That chapter is so much newer, so much younger, more recent than the second, third. Well, then you are already out of the traditional Jewish fold, which says that they were all written by God and given to Moses at a rather specific time in history, you see. So if you want to start taking a scientific point of view, it will be easily possible to get out of the whole thing, but then that destroys already the Jewish concept that God is the author of the Torah and that therefore we ought to follow what the Torah says. Yes, sir? One of the few things that's been published about Soloveitchik is something that I wrote, which I pieced together out of notes that his students have taken from his lectures. Uh, it's, as far as I know, one of the two or three places that you can find anything about his point of view. And uh, it would be interesting to know whether what I had to say is true or not. But even though I hope that by saying what I said, I might smoke him out a little bit, no comment. No comment has been forthcoming whatsoever. 
What? I'm referring to an article I wrote in the Commentary magazine in November of last fall in which I tried to define his intellectual position. But uh, he made no comment concerning it, as I guess he would not. Uh, mostly, uh, Rackman's comments are taken from his lectures, since he lectures regularly at Yeshiva University. He's professor of Talmud there, and is also chairman of the law committee of the American trained Orthodox rabbis groups. But none of this is written out. It would be very interesting to see. He has also been very ill, as you know. He's had a major operation, and this too may have something to do with his refusal to accept the post, at least for the time being. Yeah. But anyone who is involved in politics sooner or later knows that what people say is one thing and what really bothers them is a second thing. And therefore, everybody has to learn how to read the newspapers and the published statements of public figures both for what they say they say and what you think they meant to say. And this is, as you will notice in the forthcoming presidential election, well, Senator Kennedy says he's this and Richard Nixon says he's this, but who, you know, who trusts either of them? As a result, there you are, you're in business. Yes, ma'am. I'm interested in what you said about the stuff about Dick in that article. You told me about Well, you know, one can use, look, Maimonides used Aristotle, and he arrived in orthodoxy. Samson Raphael Hirsch used Hegel and arrived at orthodoxy. And what I am saying is that Soloveitchik uses Kierkegaard and arrives at orthodoxy, and it's just that simple. It's a kind of midrash, only he feels that the midrash is the kind of midrash which, once you understand it, drives you toward accepting the Torah and living by its law. And that's all that I was trying to say. Is that the opposite? No. An existentialist is a person with a certain philosophical point of view. And he may wind up either as an atheist, as Sartre does, or as a Roman Catholic, as Gabriel Marcel does, or as an Orthodox Protestant, as Karl Barth does, or as a semi-liberal Protestant, as Reinhold Niebuhr is, or as a liberal Jew, as I shall say Martin Buber is in two weeks, or as an Orthodox Jew in this particular case, as uh, Soloveitchik is. The philosophic method may lead you to different results, but by use of the philosophic method, he has to be called an existentialist. I don't think there can be any question about it, if I understand him correctly. Yes, last uh, question. I have seen some different kinds of issues. One day, when they were The Young Israel group was started largely in the New York area, I think, and then spread to other areas where the young people wanted to be affiliated with traditional congregations which were more attuned to their own needs than to the needs of their East European immigrant parents and forebears. They wanted such things as occasional discussions in English rather than in Yiddish. They wanted to have certain kinds of singing, certain kinds of instruction they wanted to have an opportunity to have Americanized synagogues. So the young Israel congregations were a kind of a rebellious Jewish Orthodox movement as against the older Polish-oriented, Russian-oriented, shtetl-oriented synagogues. Then over a period of time, you have a whole group of synagogues with a certain kind of elan, a certain kind of, of program, a certain kind of feeling. And now these make up a party movement within orthodoxy. It's a little difficult to know now what their distinctive stamp is. But insofar as you have the older synagogues controlled by the older men, these synagogues, these synagogues are now controlled by what used to be the older men, who, uh, what used to be the younger men, who have now become a little older. See what happened? Sure. <laughs> 25 years ago, they founded their congregation is going to be young and modern and adapted and so on and so forth. And they've, held, they've maintained control of it, you see. So now the young Israel has become not such a young Israel, and the older congregation around the corner has gotten a new infusion of blood. This is an old institutional problem, and since there is no organization among Orthodox congregations to kind of keep moving them all along, to give them guidance, if Jews will accept guidance, we have a certain problem here. Uh, this is what happens. 
Well, we will take up the trouble of the conservative Jews next week. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. Thank <laughs> you.